obviously we are all doing this because of that, because we want to help the ones that need it the most. But we also are a huge network of students around the globe trying to connect, trying to build, trying to actually improve academically, improve nursery called care, and improve quality of life of our patients. People are fascinated by that. They're fascinated exactly. by the underdog. They're fascinated by students that are coming up with projects that save people. Welcome to the Mission Brain Podcast, the official podcast of the Mission Brain Foundation, bringing insights into the fascinating realm of global neurosurgery. Everyone, we're here with uh, JP Navarro. He is a fellow at the Mayo Clinic in Dr. Quinones' department, and he is also the coordinator of all LATAM chapters of Mission Brain. It's great to have you here at the Mayo Clinic, and it's great to have you on the show. Thank you, Luca. Thank you, everyone involved in this amazing idea of the podcast, Mission Brain. It's a pleasure for me to be here. So we can get started with what's been happening with the chapters. There's been an incredible growth. We've been growing. How many chapters do we have? Well, we have received over 80 applications by now, and well, not all of them are active, but we can with 64 active chapters around the globe right now. That's a good, pretty good number, I think, considering the amount of countries involved. That actually, we have 19 countries involved right now. So it's pretty amazing. Right? That's impressive. What are the countries that have most chapters? Obviously, Mexico is one of them. The U.S. Well, I mean, the U.S should be the top of the rock, right? Because it's the local. <laughs> yeah. So the US has, I think, 22, 23 chapters. It is the one with more chapters than Mexico, Italy, and probably India. It's, it's the one in the list. Other countries are starting to apply with more chapters, such as Colombia. And I heard some countries in Europe want to create more chapters as well. Some countries in Asia want to do so. So we're very excited about that. So what do you think are the factors that made this chapter program so successful? I mean, it just started a couple of years ago. It was crazy, me. I mean, I, I, I think that no one ever imagined how powerful and how big this was going to be at some point. Like, it started about two to three years ago. And when they launched the application for the chapters, I don't think they knew how much of an impact it would have in all of our students around the globe. Like, I mean, personally, it had a huge impact on me. I know it had on you and everyone involved in it. So when we started to see applications coming up almost every day, it was amazing, you know? It was, it was, it was really weird and amazing at the same time. It was very, Kind of difficult to try to keep control of all of it. That's what we are trying to do now, obviously. But at some point, there were just so many applications that we were just amazed, but at the same time, kind of like scared because we don't know how to handle all the, the, those numbers. But for uh, like, it is good to know that everything came up to be right. All the students involved in this have good willing to work with us and they, they, the intentions are good so that's that's something amazing that's something that obviously have helped mission brain on being a successful chapter program because all of the students that are committed to the mission are working into a same goal which is improving global healthcare that that's something amazing like to achieve that so many minds around the globe to, to join into some come together. the same mission, come together into one. That's, that's just amazing. I, I really love that about the mission, right? It's amazing. Yeah, it's been a beautiful journey. And you've been in it from the beginning. Yes, yes. I mean, I can, I can, I can probably assure you, I mean, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty, pretty confident about that, that my chapter, the one that I opened, it was the UAD chapter in Guadalajara. It was one of the first one, if not the first one in Mexico. And that was amazing, the experience, because at first I opened it because I was following Dr. Q for many years, you know? I was, I was completely in love with Dr. Q's work, with everything he's done throughout his entire life. I know all of, all of us admire Dr. Q. And uh, so being part of something where Dr. Q was involved for me was an honor, you know? 
but I never thought about the impact that it could have. The, the fact of being able to communicate with people around the globe, with medical students, with peers around the globe from many countries that I never even imagined to have contact with. We started to have contact with Milan at some point, you were there. We had to start contact with Puerto Rico, with many, many countries that I never imagined at that point in my life that I could actually have a connection with. So it was very, very, very powerful to me. You really inspired me to keep going on the same direction that I did. And I'm very grateful with that. And well, I would never do anything different than what I did. Yeah, it, was, it was very good. You know something that just occurred to me? Maybe the fact that COVID happened basically in the midst of this and the fact that we shifted from having relationships in person to Zoom calls and the normalization of remote communication. That may have played a very important part in the reason why the chapter program was successful. Yeah, definitely. Definitely that was that was key on the on the growth of the chapter program because I mean I can personally say that before the pandemics, before the lockdown, I didn't even know how to do an online meeting with anyone. It wasn't a concept, right? I didn't it know how to use Zoom. Yeah. You know? I didn't know how to do it. It was Every, every, like all of those ideas for me were in the screen, in the cinemas, in the TV, you know? I wasn't yeah, yeah. leaving that. American was, stuff. Yeah. American <laughs> stuff so far away from me. Yeah. I mean, the way I do stuff is going to school and seeing my teachers, seeing my peers, and that's it. But imagine to have to be at your home because at that point I was working at a hospital and I was sent back home because we weren't allowed to be at a hospital because obviously the pandemic. So yeah, I had the same experience. It was hard, right? Yeah, hard work. But at that time, I remember that Zoom started, at least for me, the, the, the Zoom wave come, comes in. And every time everyone starts like send you, sending you Zoom links to have a meeting, you're like, okay, how am I supposed to have a meeting from my house? That was, that was amazing. And that helped us a lot because basically that way we learned that we don't even need to be in the same room to share ideas. And yeah. to start working and to start collaborating with each other. And well, basically, when I first had the connection with Milan, for me was amazing because I met Adrian through a journal meeting. And then Adrian was like, hey, dude, we should, we should actually collaborate. Your chapter, my chapter, we should do something together. And it was incredible to think that my peers in another different continent are wanting like one to work with me and with my team you know and that i was like there is no way this is happening like yeah. there is no way i'm actually like having a meeting with students from milan at the same exact time that that i don't know i don't know what, what... yeah it was crazy and also the thing that really makes it weird is like what i, I remember the first time i met you because people don't know, but we had a podcast together, which was really low quality. I was a horrible <laughs> interviewer. I was like the first chapter, right? Yes. I think we will put it out one day just to put shame on myself. <laughs> just in the bloopers. <laughs> yeah, just in the bloopers, exactly. <laughs> and I remember that we were in different time zones. And I think for you, it was at nighttime. And for me, it was day. I remember that there was the time shift. You could actually see we were on different sides of the globe. Yes. And that seems like a very simple thing, but it is not intuitive at all. Like we're literally on the opposite sides of the globe. One has the sun coming in, the other has the sun, no, no sun at all. For him, the sun doesn't even exist. And we're communicating, we're talking about doing projects together, we're talking about building something bigger than just Guadalajara, Italy, Humanitas, whatever. Yeah, that was, that was wonderful. I, I remember that time. I mean, uh, this guy comes seeing, he said, hey, I'm Luca, I'm from Humanitas. I'm trying to record a podcast. Will you be interested? And I was like, okay, that sounds interesting. At that, at that point, my mind only thought about podcasts. My only idea about podcasts was just famous people speaking or, or giving advice or something like that or, or news or something like that. But this guy coming in, saying I want to do a podcast about mission brain I was like okay that's sounds very interesting because we do have a lot to say and we we do need to put this idea out on the world so more people get inspired so yeah it was it was a very nice experience 
with you back then. Albeit it's horrible quality. <laughs> <laughs> with horrible quality. We have a nice time. <laughs> yeah, we did have a nice time. That's the most important thing. Yeah, it is important. I mean, you you have grown the podcast amazingly with Alice and, and, and the team. I don't know how many people are involved. With Eleven this. people are involved. Eleven people. That's wonderful. I mean, that's just wonderful. That, that, that means that there is 11 people working towards the goal. And at the end, it's just part of the team. You know, we are we are a huge team. Each of us is one huge team made of different chapters around the world. That's a good point. First of all, shout out to my team. They're incredible. My editors, <laughs> my writers, everyone. Things that people don't understand is I, I get here and we have a conversation, but there's so many things that go on before this. Sorry. You don't know, but the camera is standing on a table that's standing on a chair that's standing on two books because we didn't have a <laughs> tripod and life gives you oranges, you make oranges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what resourcefulness is all about. I think that's the projects that we have. We, we did have a lot to start with. We didn't have expenses. Now we're going to get into the specific projects, but we basically kept expenses to zero on most of the projects. We didn't invest money. We have been making money without putting anything in. And I think that's where it really gets creative when you need to collaborate and bring people together. Because if you have money to do things, you can just put money in and then get money out like a business. Exactly. But here you got a problem solved. Because if you don't have the funds, if you don't have the money, if you've got to keep the expenses low, you've got to come together with other people. You've got to build connections and relationships. Exactly and further corporate relationships as well, personal relationships, to get things for really low prices, which is, it's fascinating. I think everybody should go through that phase of life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a good point you're touching there. The fact that we started the chapter program and, well, right now I'm the regional director, but back then I was the president of one chapter. And when you are trying to create an event, you don't even know that what, what's behind all of those events? Like all those events that you see, all those Congress, all the CNNs, all the ANS, all the symposiums, it's they a lot of work. take a lot of work, a lot of work, and also a lot of money, as you said. Like it takes a lot of money put into, into the table to be able to create a nice project and to come up with a nice idea, a nice event at the end. But back then, when I was the president of the chapter, we had the same idea, like we want to do something nice, something big. We don't have not even a single penny to do it. So how do we do it? How can we make this come true? You know? And it was amazing how we started brainstorming with ideas, trying to, to figure out how can we have quality at the same time that we have no budget. Yeah. You know? How can we manage? And it was very simple because when you talk to the different doctors, people, students about what you are doing and why you are doing it, they understand and they are willing to chip in into your project. That's amazing. I mean, we we went with many, many neurosurgeons in Mexico and talked about mission brain and if they were interested on in being part of our symposium because we were not able to pay them like trips or anything, but they were able to work with us and they were willing to give us their time because at the end, they knew that the goal of Mission Rain was, was something that they were looking for so many times ago, you know? When they were kids, yeah, when they were our age, they wanted to have a structure that would allow them to do that kind of thing. Exactly. And many of them, like in my experience as well, this is, I think, a common experience that we had, they, they almost gave up on their dream until they see people come to them, young people that have nothing. They only have their determination and goodwill. And even sometimes ingenuity, like sometimes we get things done because we don't know how they should be done exactly. and that you need money to get them done and that you need resources. We just don't know. And so we just go straight for our, our road and people are fascinated by that. They're fascinated exactly. by the underdog. They're fascinated by students that are coming up with projects that save people, which is quite rare, honestly. Exactly. What we're doing is very rare on a global landscape. I mean, not the concept of the Mission Brave Foundation. There's many foundations that help people. But the concept of people coming together, students in organized networks all over the world, that, that, that's that, very unique. For me, that's that, that's one of the most, as you say, unique and most impressive things about the Mission Brain Chapter Program. The way that we are a huge network, or as Dr. Q likes to say, we are a huge organism or brain and interconnection of neurons around the globe. 
where we are not only a foundation. Basically, that's that's our main goal to help people. Obviously, we are all doing this because of that because we want to help the ones that need it the most. But we also are a huge network of students around the globe trying to connect, trying to build, trying to actually improve academically, improve nursery care, and improve quality of life of our patients. And that's that's amazing. That's something that you cannot put a price on. It. That, that, that's, I agree. That's wonderful. So this is something that I wanted to explore more seriously because the way that Mission Brain is with the central foundation at the regional chairs that we'll, we'll talk about in yeah. very great detail, and then the chapters, to some people, or at least to the uninitiated, it may seem like some sort of pyramid scheme to get money to the center. But the truth is that if you see what the chapters have been doing, that is not what it is at all. There is no money being funneled to the center of the foundation because we are actually in chapters and in regional chairs working towards original goals and original missions and original projects that have nothing to do with the work that the foundation was doing until a year ago. I mean, the, the Mission Break Foundation was based upon the mission first. Yeah. So going on a mission. But the idea of the hackathon was completely chapter created. The idea of the upsurge in symposium or the symposium that you organized in Guadalajara, that was completely created by students, sourced by students, with expenses that came from students. And the funds are being used to, to support other student-led projects, which is something that I think should be appreciated more because it's, it's a very unique thing. I mean, from that point of view, we can talk about the project that you guys are doing or, or started in Milan and how you are self-funding your yeah. own project, you know? Mm. How, how you created this amazing idea of having this academic impact in many, many students there and how it's getting self-funded over and over again to just reach all over the world and be able to educate yeah. people. So but explaining it to the people that are not quite aware of what this is, we're dealing with the upsurge in symposium and suturing mission. So the way it started is a student from Mani, her name is Matilde Pitarello, she came up with this idea. And she came up with the idea of contacting Federico Nicolosi at Upsurgeon, which actually is going to be a future guest of ours. And in Italy, Upsurgeon is a very, very popular company. It's been becoming popular all over the world and in yes, the US yes. as well. Now I've been seeing it here it's all around, really which really is good. something that I was not expecting at all from, you know, Puny little Italian company. But anyway, Matilde contacted Federico Nicolosi and she asked him to donate some neurosurgical simulators to the Mission Brain Humanitas chapter. So it was something that started extremely local. And we got the simulators. We had some neurosurgeons come in from Humanitas Reacher's Hospital because we have a great relationship with our hospital, which is, I think, one of the most valuable things that you can have as a chapter locally. We can discuss that later. But the, the most incredible thing is we were able to organize a huge event which was able to raise more than $5,000 with really low entry prices in which neurosurgeons were teaching on actual life simulators, advanced anastomosis techniques and dural suture techniques. And uh, well, this is a very interesting initiative, but I think we will both agree that the most interesting thing is how, as you said, the money and the funds that have been raised for this event have been actually already used to transfer these neurosurgical simulators to Spain during the, the Guimbernat Surgical Society Sorry. event to organize another event in Spain. And actually, this, what was a local event, became an international event because now we have a suturing mission, which is an event that's planning on sending these neurosurgical simulators, which are reusable, around the world, expanding the mission and allowing medical students and even residents from Mexico to use them students and the residents from India to use them, from Pakistan, from South Africa. And we can expand this mission all over the world just using the funds. And then we can talk about the issues with that, but just using the funds from that very first event in Milan. Yeah, that, 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 that's something wonderful. And uh, the way that I see it is, I mean, Mission Brain was born with three ideas, three main, three main ideas. So, Obviously, we all know where, where are those ideas, but we, we will just say for the sake of the, uh, of the program. So, treat, treat educate, educate, empower. empower. Okay? Obviously, we all know that, <laughs> those three words. So, the part of treating patients, that's something that was already going on because 
Dr. Q, Dr. Lawton, April, Will, they were already doing missions, they were helping people, and that's, that's the main goal of the foundation, right? But the other two words were not that much put into use, you know? So when the chapters program started and when the chapters program started working, and the part of empowering got a really, really high impact because you were giving students from all over the world, no matter what background you had, the power, the opportunity to be part of this mission, of this foundation, of this movement that's going on around the world. That was beautiful. And then the chapters started working and started creating projects and started doing things like the ones that you just mentioned. And you see that the educating part of the foundation is being powerful now. So people around the globe are starting to, to learn and, and be able to access quality education that basically you don't, it is not easy in middle and low income countries to have access to this kind of education, the ones that you are receiving in the US or that you could probably receive in, in Europe. It's not easy to have access to that in, in, in low and middle income countries. And I think that we are moving towards there, you know? We're getting there. We're getting there. And I think this is a good point, and actually we discussed this prior to the interview, the challenges that events like the Suture Mission have to face yeah. from now on. Because as you said, it's good to do events. In Italy, it's good to do events in Spain. But of course, in Italy and Spain, we do have the opportunity during residency to access very high-level simulators and a very high-level surgical techniques and surgical training. What would be really powerful is to get these simulators to the lower and middle income countries that do not have access to this kind of simulators and training and end up going through residency without ever touching a patient and therefore without ever knowing how to perform certain types of surgeries. And so the issue is how do we get these simulators to Mexico? I mean, but even more to South America and to certain African countries and to certain Asian countries that are lower and middle income. Yes, I mean, countries like Mexico do have a nice residency program. So I think the biggest goals here or the biggest barrier will be to get to those countries that do not have strong residency programs or the strong healthcare systems, you know? So we have a few, well, not a few, we have a lot of those countries in Latin America that it would be really, really cool and really useful to see these kind of technologies or these kind of movements towards helping these residents or help, helping even the brain surgeons in those countries, not, not only the residents, but That's the brain point. surgeons there, you know? So we were talking about everything that's involved in shipping all this stuff. That's something that we have to think about. We have to work on that because obviously you guys started in Italy and to move all the equipment from Italy to Spain is not that hard. You guys are in Europe, so it doesn't represent that yeah. much of a, of a deal, you know? But I think it will be another story to have them move from Spain or from Italy to, let's say, Haiti or... But you know, that's what's exciting. Because as we were saying, that's when you need to problem solve. Definitely. That's when you need to find solutions. It is challenging. That's amazing. The way you are doing this, it's amazing. I know we don't have anything, so everything solved yet, but we will. We will solve it, and that'll be really cool. I remember that in the first interview we had for the, the podcast that will never come out, I decided <laughs> in these 10 minutes, we were talking about how having barriers in the middle is actually a really good thing to develop character and develop solutions. And I was talking to Dr. Bechtel, that actually works here, which he will be on the podcast shortly, but we've been having incredible conversations about this kind of stuff, about all the things that were invented to go to space, which then, and he's a flight surgeon, which then ended up being used in everyday life, like non-scratch contact lenses and MRI machines and CT scans. They were all invented. And how do you call the, the surgery, the eye surgery, the LASIK surgery it was all invented for space travel and space exploration and then ended up changing people's lives. So who knows that in trying to solve issues like transporting simulators from Italy or Spain to certain countries, countries in Latin America or Africa, we may not end up with discoveries or solutions that may impact 
way more than just transporting a few simulators to another country. Exactly. I mean, what I've learned through all these years is you have to keep your mind open. You have to set your goals really, really high because when you do that, basically you can do whatever you want. And you can reach and you can actually change the world. I mean, you don't have to find cancer cure to change the world. I mean, that would be, it would that would be pretty be really cool. cool. That's yeah. actually what we're trying to do here at the Q Lab. But you don't have to do it to change the world. You can do your own part, do your own thing, work locally. But you can change the world by working in even the smallest things that you you didn't even you don't even think of. You can change the world that way. I agree with, with all of that. And you know, some, to some people, it may seem like, you know, just sterile things we're saying and very general. And that's why I think it's very important to get into detail with what we're, we've been actually doing because there's nothing sterile about what we're saying. I think it can look sterile to people that have not seen the impact that we've been having on people, on actual patients and actual residents that thank us for the training that we are providing. And uh, so there's nothing sterile about the idea of building bridges or the idea of changing the world or the idea of changing neurosurgical education because it's what we are practically doing every exactly. single day. I mean, that's something very important to talk about because, I mean, I met you in person in Mexico City. I know we, we both went to the same mission trip with Mission Brain to Mexico City in last September. After leaving all that experience after, after seeing all those surgeries, all the impact that we actually had in all those people, it makes you think that everything you're doing is worth it, you know? Yes. So, and it clicks. It makes sense in a way that it just doesn't make if you don't see things with your own eyes. Exactly. So we are trying like, to, to, to get that kind of information, to, to get that kind of impact into a newsletter. Yes. So Let's talk the that. same way we were inspired during that mission trip, we can inspire all the people that don't have, don't, don't have the access to go to those mission trips, don't, yes. don't have the opportunity to go, but we can still inspire them. And that's why we came up with the idea of creating the newsletter. So how has that been proceeding? The newsletter was, was an idea that, that was born probably more than a year ago. And I wasn't even regional director back then. So as the foundation kept growing, we had first, we, well, they created these regional director positions, which I'm honored to be the regional director for Latin America, also Avia for Europe, Somia for Asia, and let's mention also Anne. Beautiful hand. Yes. <laughs> Beautiful hand. So by the time that Alejandro, our new CEO, or it's not new anymore, but he has been here a while, for a while already, but our CEO, when he came, he was completely game changing. We needed a CEO. We needed a CEO yes. because he he's giving the Mission Brain Foundation a really nice structure. He's coordinating everything beautifully. And this way we were able to actually work on the Mission Brain newsletter. So we relaunched the application. We received more applications. And then we started doing interviews. We came up with this amazing team that we have already with so Maya. Who are the people? It's Maya, it's Tima. It's Santa, Niha, and Francesca. From Italy. Yeah, Francesca. Francesca. Francesca, amazing. So this is a great team. I mean, personally, I only interview Niha and Maya. Mm -hmm. And the interviews I had with Niha, at, like from the beginning, as soon as I opened my laptop and I heard her talking. She's incredible. I said, she is going to be our editor. She's, she's amazing. I actually she had, she had a podcast had a episode podcast. Yeah, yeah, with her. Yeah. She is incredible. And the things they've been doing in Mission Brain India. It's amazing. It's, I mean, I think in Italy, like, we wouldn't be able to do that no, because of regulations, to be fair. Yeah. But just the idea of completely like, having a clinic and running a clinic as medical students is the most insane idea Their ever. Their chapter is so active, yes. so so wonderfully willing to give out to their communities. It's beautiful to, yeah. to see all the work that Nick has doing there. I think what they do better than many chapters is the community work, yeah, being yeah. more in touch with their community. That, that's amazing. I mean, that, that's something that they are actually doing right now, and 
that would be super, super good for other chapters to start doing. Obviously, as you said, it is more difficult for people from different countries, such as Italy or the US, to do those or, kind or of... Or Mexico as well. Yeah. In Mexico, or, also, we have some regulations that don't allow us, but we can somehow find a way to do it, you know? Yeah. I, I think whatever you are in, in, in the world, you can find a way to do the kind of things that these people are doing in, in that is a good point, and that is actually the main thing that we are trying to change when it comes to our mission break Italy locally. I mean, we've been talking about internationally how we build bridges among each other, but locally, I think it is very important to remember about the overarching mission of helping people in lower yeah. and middle income countries. But I do think it's very important to give back to the community where you are because you need a local support structure. I mean, as Dr. Quinone says as well, to have a good tree you need good roots exactly. and you need to have the roots in the place in which you are. And then you can use those roots to go somewhere else and do something beautiful with your life and with a surgeon's life. Like a good example is the, like the Lisa Hannigan scholarships. Wow. The, the projects they've come up with, for those that don't know a little bit of basic context is. So basically what the Lisa Hannigan scholarship was started a couple of years ago and it is meant to give the opportunity to residents or medical students to start research projects or contribute in some way with the mission principles of educating, treating, and empower around the world. And in the context of global neurosurgery. In the context of global neurosurgery, yeah, absolutely. So what Maria is doing in Mexico City, she is collaborating with the National Institute of Neurology and Neurosurgery there in Mexico City. And she's trying to improve. She, she, she's changing the world already, you know? Just because trying, she's already changing the world. Same with Megan. She's trying to change the course of global neurosurgery, especially at Sierra Leone. She's breaking this idea of there is no neurosurgical care there. But that, that is insane to think about. It's amazing. It's, it's crazy to think crazy. about that there is no neurosurgeons. Exactly. I mean, the latest, I, 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 didn't even know. I didn't even know as well. But many countries are in that situation. One of the latest episodes I had was with Ernest Barthelemy. And we had a conversation about Haiti because he is from Haiti. And until 2019, before there was a big crisis in Haiti, yeah. he spent lots of time going back and forwards. And the thing is, there is no neurosurgeons in Haiti. There's like six fully trained neurosurgeons in the entire country for millions of people. That is something that most of us, I mean, I did not grasp it. I was quite ignorant it blows prior your to mind, right? Yeah. The same happened to me when I was, we were thinking uh, a few months ago, probably like a year ago, let's say a year ago, we were thinking with Dr. Q and he told us at region, I was like, director, like, you should help me or help the foundation to open a chapter in Africa. That would be beautiful. And we start thinking, how can we reach someone in Africa? You know, I don't know anyone in Africa. I didn't know anyone in Africa, neither Adrian, neither Samia, and we were thinking. And at that point, uh, Maria Punchak was traveling in Uganda. Mm, she was doing some really she, cool projects. She was doing a rotation well. there in Uganda. Yeah. And I saw the big kind of like, Maria, please hook me up with someone from that university. I need to open a chapter there. We need to open a chapter there. We need someone there working. And she was very nice. And she got me in contact with Timothy. Those are, well, currently they are the, uh, the board of our chapter in Uganda. And it was beautiful to connect with them because at the same, at the first meeting we had, and me and Samia connected. And we were just talking to them, trying to inspire them. and to get them to be part of Mission Brain. But we didn't we didn't know that we didn't even have to do anything to get inspired. They were they were already inspired because they read about Mission Brain. Maria told them about Mission Brain and they were dying to open a chapter there because the same problem. Only eight neurosurgeons or something like that in the whole country for millions and millions of people. And when they told me that I was like, there's no way. There's course, no possible way that... There's eight neurosurgeons for millions of people. One, yeah. There's one neurosurgeon for a Hundreds crazy of amount of people. Yeah. So that, that's, that's just something It just that feels you, wrong. It just feels like it you can't be like that. That, 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 that shouldn't be right, you know? And most people are not aware. 
Exactly. That, that, this, that people think that there's low quality of care. People think that they're understaffed. But here we're not talking about being understaffed. We're talking about one neurosurgeon per millions of people. Yeah, millions of people, not only millions of people, millions of people in need of neurosurgical care. Yes. It means that for every person, for example, neurotrauma is a very big thing in most exactly. low income countries. So many people go into traffic accidents. There's nobody to, I don't know, even drain a very simple hematoma. It's... <laughs> Yeah, 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 it's it's crazy. It's very sad, but it's something that also inspires us to keep working, you know. Yeah. To to keep changing the world. And what Timothy, Mucho Caleb, and, and the team is doing there, it's amazing. They are contributing. They are constantly active. They are having symposiums as well, trying to contribute in their own way. It's amazing the way we are connecting now with Africa. That's amazing. And also, we're gonna bet that very soon there's gonna be a ton of chapters in Africa as well, we because the concept. So. It just spreads like wildfire. Yeah, we, we really hope so. I mean, we only have two. That in Uganda and the other one in Mauritius. Hopefully, in the next couple of months or years, we have more than 20 chapters in Africa. That would be incredible. And we are missing also uh, Australia. So we have to open a chapter in Australia too. Yeah, Oceania. Oceania. We should organize a mission in Africa. And I think as Mission Brain Europe, we could help coordinate that very well because we're quite close. Like organizing a mission and sending equipment from the US or from Mexico or from Latin America to Africa is quite costly. While if, if you look even just as plane travel, which is actually a bigger part of price than people think, it's much lower from Europe than it is from anywhere in the US or South America. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And there are so, so many countries in need in this world. Obviously, for obvious reasons, we cannot reach all of them by now. But in, in, in the bigger picture or the longer shot, we, we aim to be able to help all those countries. Not just to focus on one, two, but to focus on the whole world, you know, to change the world as a unit and not as several uh, countries. So let's try to problem solve when it comes to the idea of organizing a mission in Africa, for example. Like, let's try to take it step by step and understand how we organize missions in Mexico. Because many people don't yeah. really know how that works, even like breaking it down financially. People just don't understand how you organize something like that. And we've been there, so, yeah. and you've been part of the organization. So get people, take them through what it means to organize a mission and what are the main factors for something to be successful. It, it, it takes a lot of work. I mean, here I, I have to shout out to Dr. Paula Mead. Yes. She was she was a mastermind behind the last trip. She organized almost everything. She was she has been wonderful for the foundation. And I know it requires a lot of lot of work. But basically you have you have to play by the book of the country, you know? So each country as we said before has its own regulations. It has its own rules, and you have to play by those rules. So you have to read a lot, learn a lot about the regulations and stuff, so you are able to practice surgery in those countries. Second point, very important, is to make connections, which obviously and hopefully and thankfully, it is easier now that we have chapters in so many countries because thinking and doing a connection before having our chapter in Uganda probably wouldn't be hard enough to just don't do it. But yeah. now that we have a chapter in Uganda, we can start building connections with the hospitals and with the surgeons there so we can actually start collaborating with each other. That's, that's a very important point because, I, I mean, for example, last mission trip, the collaboration was between Mission Brain and I mean, the Foundation. Yeah. So that was super helpful for us, for our patients, and for the future of the foundation, obviously. So to start to build all those kind of collaboration, connection with, with centers and doctors and students from around the globe, that's key to organize a successful mission. Other things, obviously, the money and budget that you need. You need a huge budget. You need a lot of money to plan a mission trip because I mean, not only the surgery, the surgery obviously is super, super crazy expensive and it's the best part of it. To, to pay all the expenses of a family, 
and that's that's going through these kind of diseases is just wonderful. But there is a lot out of the out of the surgery that costs a lot of money. So you have to find a way to cover all those expenses. And that's that's one of the main issues of it, I think so. We now I think we now know how to do it in Mexico. That's why we're planning two more in Mexico this year. We are moving our way. Obviously Alejandro is being the one organizing this one. He's the one making all the connections in Monterrey, making the connections in Guadalajara, start to build up, start he's, eating. He's got incredible connections. He's, so he's yeah. doing great. Without Alejandro, I don't think it will be possible to do these two missions in one year. What would the two missions be? And what would they be about? What do we know up to now? And what are we just still trying to figure out? So I'm more involved in the one for Monterrey. And in the Monterrey one, we will collaborate with the university. We Tech? have a chapter there. Yeah. yeah. Take the Monterrey. We will collaborate with Take the Monterrey. Which is an amazing uni, right? I think it's the greatest, like the best university in Mexico for me, for my point of view. And the chapter there is, it, it is made of only women. And they oh, were really? amazing. They were not aware very good. Answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, Victoria is the president. We have Karen, we have Paloma. All of those girls are putting a lot of effort to make this mission come true. It's, it's amazing, actually. And they are, star, they, are, they are already working with Alejandro, with the authorities of their university to actually come up with something, something really big and something really good and, and, and meaningful, you know? So that's amazing. I mean, you remember the event we had the last mission trip at Anahuac? Oh, yes. Where we had over a thousand students. Let's talk deeply about that, Dude, that because was that was incredible. That changed something in my brain. That that event actually blew all of our minds. It yes. was it was a. I don't think none of us expected something that no. big. No, you know, and that and it wasn't only how many people there were. It yeah. was the excitement the in the air. Doctor Quinones, but actually, <laughs> frankly, everyone, all of us were treated like celebrities. Like Doctor Quinones looked like Mick Jagger. Yeah, yeah, we we're yeah. surrounded by people. I've never seen anything like that for we a had brain to surgery. Take him out. Yeah. Have you ever seen no, something like that? No, no, no. It looked like a celebrity. It was like crazy. A list celebrity. It was incredible. I mean, when they launched this idea and they started putting this idea in the air about having a chapters meeting, the first student chapter meeting in person in Mexico City. I thought, okay, it's a nice idea, but, but yeah, I don't know how many people are coming, you know. Yeah. And I asked Paula, hey Paula, how many tickets are we? Do, do we want to sell or do we want? We we want to sell. Is this the same? We didn't even sell them. Was, they were for free, but you had to register to be able to get a ticket. So how many tickets are we giving out? It was like our goal or our main idea is to minimum a thousand. Oh, like, she had she she had it from the a beginning. Thousand, Power. okay, wow. And then we started working, and I was doing all the connections between the chapters in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And first of all, I thought it was it was going to be very hard for the chapters to actually come to the to, to the event. But when I launched the the, the invitation, when when I sent them through an email, I got an incredible response. Like. Almost all the chapters in the in, in the whole country came, and they were like, "Hey, yes, we are very interested. We are coming from Oaxaca, which is very far away from Mexico City. We are coming from Tijuana, which is the northern part of Mexico. It's quite far. It is far. If you know Mexico, it's a it's, huge it's, Yeah, it's so huge. you have to fly. I mean, flying from Tijuana to Mexico City should be around three, four hours. Yeah, right? and it's expensive. You pay for a flight, expensive. get there, and if to go back. People were willing to go because yes. they knew the the impact of being there and you know, being with their peers, or finally get to know the people that they were working with virtually, but finally get to talk to them face to face. I'm and feeling guilty for not organizing something like that in we Europe should, yet. We should, we should, and we will. Do it. Definitely, we will. Yes. But this was this was just amazing, yeah, you know. So powerful for, for 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 people in Latin America. Obviously, we would have loved to have more people from other countries in South America. We 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 didn't. Hopefully, in the future, we will. I mean, it of is course. obviously it is more difficult for them yes. to travel. But we have to find a way, or maybe do an event in Latin America and South America 
I don't know, just putting ideas out there. Figure it out. Global yeah, event. Global event. Global event. Is it some events like this? Hackathon, man. We have to talk about the hackathon. Let's too. talk about the hackathon because the hackathon blew my mind. The hackathon is crazy. I mean, the, the hackathon, it was. So let's start from the beginning. Yeah. Start from the so, beginning. So, Mission Brain Hackathon, this idea started by what else? Who else? The beautiful. Harvard Medical School <laughs> students, obviously, led by Han are now a regional director of the US. They had this idea of the hackathon that when I first heard the word hackathon, I didn't I didn't even know what that was. Like we're hosting a hackathon. I was like, what the hell hackathon? Yeah, you think you think MIT, you exactly. think computer like, science. Yes. How can you apply a hackathon into healthcare, you know? Yes. And I started reading about it and fans started to tell me more about the idea they had. And I was like Hey, this sounds nice, but let's see how you execute this idea. And I participated, I sent my application, I got the opportunity to participate. I had a team with Natasha Frontera from Puerto Rico and, from, oh, and with Adrian from Milan. We were the three, we, were, we had a team, the three of us. And we just had the nicest time ever, just trying to come up with ideas to change the world or to help people in low and middle income countries, it was amazing. I mean, I think I can remember the idea we had was something about telemedicine, how to bring, uh, how, how to how, how to help doctors from the US to help doctors in low and me middle income countries to collaborate with them and help them through cases, through surgical cases. So basically the idea of Natasha and Adrian and I had was to have a TV mm -hmm. or a computer or a screen with the doctor in the US connected virtually, saying or advising on the case. surgeons in another case on how to act or how to proceed. So it's a it's a long distance online consultation system. That was that was our idea. Obviously we didn't want, otherwise I would have said that from the beginning. But we had that idea. You won for the Mission Brain <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Give you a medal later. <laughs> <laughs> so we had that idea and we thought it was a really good idea. Obviously, when we didn't win, we weren't even bummed about it. We weren't even sad because no. we did our part. We worked and, and it was amazing. And that year, last year, the winners of, 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 of that hackathon were the team movement, which you know, you, you met them before. It's Trevo, Ignacio and Jose. Uh, two Mexicans and one U.S. citizen that came up with this brilliant idea that didn't even cross my mind when I was in the hackathon. Neurorehabilitation. Oh, neurorehabilitation. For remote communities. Exactly. Yes. So that was crazy to see how people were collaborating with each other. I mean, Trevor was applied as a single, you know, and Ignacio and Jose applied as a team Yeah, they've known each other for a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ignacio and Jose did mm -hmm. because they were at the same university in Guadalajara. But Trevor didn't know them, you know? So what the guys in Harvard did was to read all the CVs and say, okay, we have this guy, Trevor, who is a genius in technology. And we have... Experienced physicians on the other side. Experience. Exactly. Yes. So let's create a team with all these assets. Yeah. They created this team, and this team actually came up with a life-changing idea. Yeah, and, and the next step is how are we going to transform exactly. these beautiful ideas into actual business opportunities? How can we make this financially viable? And what does this mean for the future of, first of all, Mission Brain? Exactly. Because we could you know, think of a future, hypothesize a future in which Mission Brain has a part of, I don't know, licensing, and the intellectual yeah, but, property. But, but at the end, we want to change the world in Judah, yeah. you know? And this is life changing. The concept is life changing. It's life changing. Yeah. And what the hackathon team did was okay, guys, you won. You won the hackathon. Here's your prize. Let's promote your application. Let's work on it. And you'll get to travel with the team on our next mission trip, which, which was uh, the one that we have in, yes. in September in Mexico City. And they were able to actually meet a patient which needed this kind of neurorehabilitation. And they were able to think and to see in person how their program was able to help someone in need. 
That was amazing. That's, that's incredible. I mean, and it's just the beginning. You are, like, it's the very tip of the iceberg. What can happen? What we can do with this idea? Exactly. It's incredible. You are you are talking about a fifteen thousand dollar prize they got, yes. and obviously they were able to give give out this prize because they got the sponsors, the big sponsors. Obviously. The white combinator. They got white combinator. They got striker. They have many many other yeah. sponsors that were able to chip in and contribute in this prize. I mean. Last year was amazing, but I have no doubts that this year will be twice as much fun. I am twice very psyched better. for this year. Actually, that my experience with Aquadon last year was exactly the same. It was incredible. Right? I also went in. No, I went in as an individual. Did you go in as a team? Or as I did with Natasha and Adrian. I think going in as an individual is even a better experience. Yeah, because you because get to know new people. I met this incredible neurosurgeon from Colombia that lives between Colombia and Venezuela. He actually has a foundation. I know him. Raul Echeverri. Yeah, of course. He's an incredible physician. And coming together with people that have such a different background and more or less experience in you, but with different features from another part of the world. And it, it, it's just perfect for problem solving. Yeah. Because you have different experiences. You've been through different things in life. You value different things. So it's perfect to team different people together with problem solving. And it's not that enough. No, you know? exactly. So they are trying to do it again. I mean, they are not trying. They are doing it again. Better. Better. Because this time they are collaborating with other chapters around the globe. Yes. So they got UAB from uh, Alabama. They got Mayo in Arizona and UNAM in Mexico City. So four the universities united into one same event. Crazy good, right? Yeah. And there's more than 200 participants. More than that. I mean, I talked to Han last week and Han told me that they were looking all over the applications mm -hmm. and they received a crazy amount of applications. They were very excited and very impressed about the impact this year is having on many students around the globe. And we're not talking only about medical students. We're talking about all kinds of engineers, engineers physicians, technology, businessmen, there's everything. Everything. Yes. You, you, you can contribute with the, for, for these kind of events with any background that you and, have. And actually, it's ideal for, as we were saying before, that people do have different backgrounds. Exactly. Like you want to put the PhD with the MBA with the medical student. Obviously. That doesn't happen that much in the world. <laughs> I mean, when yeah. Adrian, Natasha, and I were thinking about solutions, we were only thinking about the medical solution, how yeah. to solve that, because we are... But then they were like, yeah, give me the business plan. And you were like, this is stumbling. I don't know how to it's take a that. <laughs> and if you say, okay, how can I build that application? How can I build that platform? No, 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 no idea. Exactly. Yes. So you can combine ideas and combine skills. And that's exactly what the Harvard team is doing right now. Reading uh, all the CVs and saying, okay, you are good in this, you are good in this. If I put you together, I have a huge, huge result. Yes. So that's, that's something wonderful. And so, so the thing is, next step is get these ideas on the market. Yeah, that's, that's going to be extremely exciting. Get them in the market and at a reasonable price or, or even, even zero. Zero. Yes. Exactly. Because that's our main goal, to bring people in need the ability to, to recover, to heal, to, to, to improve their quality of life. And I think that's, that's what moved me out of the way right now. And to the naysayers that say that something like that is impossible, it is not. There is proof in the past of things like this happening. It, it's not as easy as it seems, of course. Providing care or whatever kind of product or service for zero is very difficult because you need to make it at least financially viable enough that it supports itself. Exactly. I mean, for me, something I like to think about is to be able to change the world, the first thing that you have to do is to care about it. You know, you have to care to change the world. The right. rest will come and you'll find out how to do it. But if you don't care, you won't do it. That's a good point. Also, because it's, it's all about the goal you have in mind. Exactly. If the goal is, you know, make a huge bunch of money and retire to... That's up to you. Well, we are not here to judge you or criticize. No, I mean, it's fine. Well, we want to change the world, right? Yeah, we just want to make it differently. Exactly. And we will. Yeah. At some point, we will. So I, sure. I want to talk about you now. Okay. A little bit. I mean, Absolutely. we've been talking a lot about Mission Brain. And I will talk about you within Mission Brain because that, that's the way that I've come to meet you. That's the way that I've come to know you. What I want to know is, what were the struggles that you went through 
growing it's together with Mr. Rain, actually, and passing from being, you know, a normal medical student, initially, correct me if I'm wrong, when you started, you were still a medical student. Yeah, yeah, I could say that. You were, like, I mean, I, I was doing my social service social when service. I started. Is, it, it is, is it's that like, technically MD or is it technically? No, it is not MD yet because I, I, I didn't receive my diploma until I finished that part. So, not MD. Medical MD. student. Oh, yeah, medical student. <laughs> Lowly medical student. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you started out like that, and then you started growing. And of course, your, the parable of your growth has something to do with Mission Brain. Because it, does. it gave you responsibilities, and it allowed you to see the bigger picture. I know because I've been through the exact same thing. Exactly. So take me through that process. What was that for you? I mean, it was, it was challenging. Obviously, it was quite challenging for me. I got to know about Mission Brain when I was doing my social service, as I mentioned before. And that's for, for us, our social services, our last medical year, which is our sixth medical year. And back then, I was thinking on doing neurosurgery. Where? I didn't know. I just knew that I had to do neurosurgery. I had to do a, I had to become a neurosurgeon. I didn't know where. So I was working. I did my social service at the National Institute of Neurology and Neurosurgery in Mexico City. And... I love that place. At some point, I was like, I want to be here. But as time was passing by, I realized that there were more outside of my country. Mm -hmm. There were other places. There were Europe. There was the U.S. And I started reading about all those residency programs. And somehow, I fell in love with the U.S. residency program in neurosurgery. So I started working on it. So how can you get into be a resident in the U.S.? A nursery resident, obviously. So when you start reading all those numbers and all those ideas and start reading what our people are saying about how difficult it is for an IMG to match you in the U.S., you start to worry a little bit about that. But somehow something told me that I should keep going, you know? Obviously, I haven't matched yet. Hopefully, I do in a couple of years. But I'm just following my path. <laughs> At that point, I was just looking in some ways on how can I start collaborating with research in the U.S. You know, to start improving my CV and and be able to somehow get the position that I am very thankful to have now here in the Mayo Clinic. So I started looking for options, and I connected first with Paola Mir. and she was very, very, very helpful from the start for me because she. And somehow she guided me through the process. And she and Ricardo Domingo invited me to their nursery co lectures, our nursery co lectures now on Monday and Friday. And I started just going in, you know, showing my face, turning my camera on, learning from them every Monday, every Friday. And at some point I saw that they said, Remember that we now have our applications open for our mission brain chapter program. So if you want to open a chapter in your, in your university, just apply. Just follow the link and send your application. I was like, okay, that sounds interesting, right? So I went into the link. I saw everything that they, they were proposing, everything they were offering, how you can collaborate with them, and how you could, at the same time that you were working to improve the world, to change the world, you were actually improving yourself. And that was amazing for me because that was exactly what I was looking for. I wanted to help people at the same time that I was pursuing my goal of coming to the U.S. and do nursery residency here. So I talked to a couple of friends of mine, and one is Valeria Terrazas, the other one is Carlos Illescas, and I was like, we should open a chat. Shout out. Shout out to them. So I was like, we should open a chapter here. It is amazing. It is the foundation of Dr. Q, Dr. Lawton. We have been following them for a long time. It will be a great way for us to contribute to the neurosurgical world. And obviously, give us, give us a little more contact with them. You know, It's a win-win really, win situation. It's a really nice way to connect. We sent our application. We got accepted. And we received an email saying, Congratulations, you are accepted as a new chapter of Mission Brain Chapter Program. We will have our first meeting with Dr. Q on, I don't know, Friday. And I was like, no way. We have a meeting with Dr. Q. 
I don't buy it. I, I don't What's the catch? It. Yes. And like, no way. Okay. Friday comes, I turn my camera on and I see many, many faces from all over the world connected at the same time as, as I was connected and no one spoke to the other. They were all in silence, muted, just looking at each other and I'm like, okay, I don't know anyone here. What are we supposed to do here? I don't see any familiar faces here. And then Dr. Q appears and he has, we know him, the nicest person in the world. He's incredible. Just thanking us for applying, explaining all about the foundation, how we want to improve global surgical care and everything. And we were delighted about it. And then we started presenting ourselves. Hey, this is me, JP from Guadalajara. My goal is to become a brain surgeon at some point in my life. Something like that. Some point. At some life. point. And when I ended up that meeting, I was like, I'm on the right path. You know, this is what I want to do with my life. I want to pursue a neurosurgery residency program in the US at the same time that I'm helping people around the globe. Which is, I think, the only way to do it. For yeah. people that come from countries like Mexico or even countries like Italy. Because like we have a completely public healthcare system. And there is that kind of conflict of interest when you think about, you know, going to, to lower middle income countries and then spending time in the Mayo where it's it's a different system. It's a completely different system. Yeah, it is. You need to you need to make peace with the difference of these systems. But the fact that you are able to reconcile these two parts of yourself that you really need is very powerful. It is. It is and it was. For me, it was, was key on, on the path that I was following back then and from the path I am following right now. So for me to get the connection with Mission Brain, to be part of it, to, be, to have the honor to now be the regional director for a whole region, that really means a lot to me, you know? And I can tell you that I always give a huge amount of my time and I give my 100% of, of, of willing to improve everything in my region and within the company. That is true. That is it true. Is. Like I pass by his office all the time <laughs> and you got research, 50%, 50% it's presentations and meetings for Mission Brain yeah, yeah. and connecting with people. I mean, there, there's nothing wrong about that. Actually, it's it's important that you keep these two things going on. It is. And and it's that's one of the other things that we're trying to do with the podcast. We're trying to show that there's different ways of arriving to the same point. M many of us want to be neurosurgeons, but just being a neurosurgeon is, of course, it's beautiful. You're going to save people's lives. But there's ways of getting there. There's ways of being a neurosurgeon. Yeah. There's ways of finding your own spot and maybe building your own spot in your own position and and having the courage to go for it and even sacrifice some of your valuable time to pursue your path and exactly. not somebody else's. Exactly. It's something you have to learn. I mean, whenever you decide or, or whenever you say, I want to become a neurosurgeon, you have to be ready to, to, to fight all of those obstacles that are ahead of you. There are many, many obstacles, especially for us as IGs, and there are many obstacles to beat before becoming a brain surgeon. And there is the fact that you have to leave home, you have to leave everything you know, you have to leave all your family, your girlfriend, your friends, you have to leave everything behind to come and pursue your dreams. But if it's your passion, you should definitely do it. You should find your passion, find your path, and just follow it and work on it. That's what's have worked for me before and that's what's working right now for me. Obviously, I still have my girlfriend, we still are boyfriend and girlfriend, and, but we are doing it in distance. It is difficult, but it's worth it. It takes a lot of sacrifice. It takes a lot of sacrifice, but that's the sacrifice we are willing to do to change the world and to become a great surgeon. Agreed. You know? Agreed 100%. So, those are the kind of little small details that you have to think about it and just to work on them from my point of view. That's beautiful. So I think we should wrap it up very soon. We've had a wonderful conversation. What I want to delve a little bit deep into before we finish this conversation is what's next? And we've spoken a lot about, about potential of specific projects. 
but what are we not doing well enough? What is the untapped potential? Where do you think that lies? And what do we have to do to unlock it? Well, for me, that's, that's a really good question. But of course, it is a tough question. I don't know if I have the right answer for it, but I'm going to try it. So for me, the way I see Mission Brain Foundation going, on how I see it in a long shot is being able to reach every single country in the globe, being able to impact every country in the globe, have chapters around the globe, like entirely in every country, but to improve our network, to improve the way that we spread education around the globe. To, because all of the other things come as a result of that. If we improve the education around the globe, our education bar, as we call it, we can improve neurosurgical care, we can improve empowerment, we can improve everything from my point of view. So the goal for me personally is to reach in my region, within my region, every single country, to have someone put in their efforts in that country to contribute to the foundation. That is beautiful. So we can start building from the bottom in each country a structure that once it's already big enough as Milan, as UAD, as UNAM, we can and ideally, definitely, yes, wow. Ideally, every single hospital. Every Think single how hospital. powerful we would be as, first of all, as a profession, but second of all, as soldiers that help patients get better. If we were better connected, if we could develop worldwide databases that allow us to collaborate and work on bigger databases with common guidelines and even research-wise, this has incredible potential in Obviously, the long term. The opportunities behind all of this are endless. Yeah. You can think and think and think on ways to change the world, and the solution is right there in front of us. Just to connect, just to keep working and fighting and follow your passion and do your best. Always do your best. Beautiful. I think this is a great way to end this. JP? Thank you. Always a pleasure, man. Always a pleasure. See you later, guys.